Kia ora Aotearoa, welcome to Wātea Fifth Estate, a multi-platform online current affairs program streamed live on wāteatv.com, the dailyblog.nz and Face TV Sky Channel 83. Better access to more views about the most important news events here in Aotearoa and globally with the best political minds New Zealand has to offer. Joining us tonight to discuss Auckland's property bubble, future growth and intergenerational friction, the Deputy Mayor of the Auckland Super City Council, Penny Hulse, Intensification Protest Group Auckland 2040 Representative Richard Burton and Salvation Army Social Policy Analyst Alan Johnson. We'll also wrap the show with a final word and let our panellists tell you what else has been on their minds. But let's get stuck into the issue of the night. Auckland is groaning under the weight of its own growth. Years of infrastructure underfunding and an urban sprawl complex that views Hamilton as a southern suburb are grinding the city and the nationwide economy to a halt. Penny, in today's New Zealand Herald, you wrote, a housing supply shortage of between 20,000 to 30,000 homes is severe. House prices have shot up. Renting options are dire and more expensive, with many Aucklanders drowning in debt. A recent housing affordability survey says Auckland housing is now less affordable than bloody Los Angeles. Why is Auckland in the poo? There are a whole lot of reasons, but put really simply, when you're about the third best city in the world, a lot of people want to live here. But this goes back decades, and I think it's been a failure of good leadership. People have simply not grasped the nettle and zoned the right amount of land and areas for good housing. And successive governments and councils have also dropped the ball. What we're trying to do now is put together the package that says, let's get the houses built in the right place at the right price with enough choice to look after everybody. Uh, today there was a survey that came out that said uh, Auckland is the third most livable city uh, yeah. in, the, in, in, in the world. So if you've got money, Auckland's a blast. What if, what if you don't have money? If you don't have money, then you join one of the 206,000 people living in overcrowded conditions in Auckland at the moment. Or you join people who, you know, trek up to Whangarei now to live in someone's garage. So, you know, Auckland, if you've got money, great. If you don't, and not even if you're terribly, terribly poor, my kids, you know, cannot afford to buy a house in Auckland. And to me, that's not good enough. Richard, you've described the way the council has treated the residents of Glendowie, St Heliers, Iraqi, Westmere, Blockhouse Bay, Panmuir and Takapuna as insulting, indefensible and undemocratic. Make a case. This is all about process, not the merits. It's nothing to do with the cost of housing. It's simply the fact that council chose to change the zoning of over 20,000 properties mm -hmm. without telling them. Mm -hmm giving them no opportunity to comment, giving mm -hmm. them no opportunity to lodge a submission and no opportunity to produce evidence at a hearing. So they've been completely disenfranchised. Yep. Those people need the opportunity to have their say. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, for the last 40 years or more, councils, when they've been changing their unitary plans or yep. district plans, yep. have given people the opportunity to comment on those plans. So I'd ask every person who's viewing this audience, if, if they had a property in a street, Mm -hmm. And if the council proposed to change the zoning of that street, would they expect to be told about it and would they expect the right to comment? Every person we've asked that question to has said resoundingly yes. Right, so this is a process issue for you guys. This is, this is you saying, hey, we live in these suburbs, we're suddenly having this foisted upon us, we want to have a say. Correct, but this is one specific issue. Mm -hmm. This is to do with the council proposing to change the zoning of 20,000 plus houses without telling anybody. Yep. That is a completely distinct issue from the merits of providing for urban growth, as yep. Penny's been saying. Yep. There is a really good argument to say that we need to increase the density of Auckland to provide for people coming, mm -hmm. and that's a combination of within the metropolitan urban limit and, and also outside as greenfields. Mm -hmm. It's how you do it and where you do it and how carefully you do it are the issues. Yeah. The problem, of course, is that people who live in those suburbs are never going to be happy with intensification, are they? No, in some to some degree, but they've got to expect that some intensification w will occur. It right. has already been occurring for the last three yep. decades. Yep. Yep. We have had suburban residential areas being infilled with housing for three decades. Mm -hmm. And no, some people don't like that. But that's not the point. 
The point is, can you get intensification of a scale that is compatible with the residential character of an area? And I'll give you a concrete example. Auckland 2040 promoted during the unitary plan process the concept of relaxing density. Mm -hmm. Now what relaxing density means is that at the present moment for an 800 to 1000 square metre site you could get two to three large townhouses built on it, yep. which obviously sell for a lot because they're expensive to build and a large component of land value. What we suggested is relax the density provisions. That enables instead of two to three, four to six dwellings. Those dwellings are smaller yep. and they're occupying l less land, therefore they will be cheaper. Where, where do you suggest the extra tens of thousands of Aucklanders live? A lot of them can live within the existing metropolitan urban limit. Mm -hmm. The increase in density provisions, as I've just explained, has had a profound effect. And in fact, uh, evidence that the council themselves has put up to the hearing panel from a very respected doctorate of geography has said that there is sufficient capacity within the zoned area of Auckland to accommodate all of the growth for the foreseeable future. So we're not talking about long-term capacity problems here. Alan, is there an intergenerational friction here? This seems to be less about NIMBY and more about BIMBY. Boomers in my backyard. Boomers who have done well, gentrified their suburbs and benefited from cradle to grave state subsidies can property speculate, Gen X, Gen Y and Millennials completely out of owning a house in Auckland, where are we, those generations, expected to buy a house in Auckland so they can commute to work? In Vicargill, is, is, that, the, is that where those generations are locked into? That's what's going to happen, isn't it? That there is going to be this exodus, and I think we're starting to see it, mm. of people leaving Auckland saying it's all too hard. Why would I think about a future in this city? And it's not the 2040 people, the people who can't imagine a life past 2040. It's not the, there's not the older people living in the wealthy suburbs who will be shifting out. It might be their children, but it'll be the other people's children as well. And I believe Auckland will be, be poorer for that. Yeah. And, you know, as, as we want to defend our property rights in the leafy and beachy suburbs of, of Auckland, we don't have much regard for that. And I just think that's incredibly selfish. Where do you suggest millennials... Gen X's and Gen Y live in Auckland? Where, where, where are they supposed to live? Look, it's clear that we're going to be going up as, as a city, as yeah. well as out, and, and I think many of us would prefer to go up simply, firstly, because there's lots of r great suburbs in Auckland mm -hmm. that are well connected, particularly to, to the rail and sometimes to, to ferries and buses. It makes sense to start to use those places as growth nodes and not simply allow it to be cut up into smaller and smaller McMansions, which is what's happening actually. You go up up and you have medium rise um, apartments. That might be where the Gen X and the Millennials are going to go and live. And right. I don't think they mind too much because yep. the lifestyles yep. are quite different to what those of the parents and grandparents If, if I could just make a comment here. Please. One of the difficulties with apartments is that the cost per square metre to build them is extremely high. Mm. So although the land component is less, the overall cost of an apartment is very high per square metre. Yep. Therefore, if you want to live in an apartment, and you still want it to be affordable, it's going to be very small. Right. But the other thing I'd like to say, and, and this goes for my own adult kids, sure. as well as a lot of other you know, similar aged people, is what their expectations are. I mean, is there expectations for a three-bedroom villa in Ponsonby? Because they aren't going to get that. And, and I could just recount, my first house was a 50 square metre fibre light shack in the bush with a tin can for a toilet. Mm. Mm. And I spent every waking hour, other than working, working on that house. And the, so and the, and the, and the point is, you were lucky enough to even be able to consider that, Richard. You know, we can get into luxury. You know, I bought my first house for $200 and we moved it, you know, out to the sticks in, in, in Waitakere. But the bottom line here is we, we don't disagree on a lot. The bit, I think, where we've come unstuck is that because 2040 has, has whipped up this kind of frenzy against intensification, We've lost the pure process debate that I respect you for. We've, we've lost the calm heads in the debate and it's turned into an anti-intensification debate. The horror of three stories being next to me, the horror of an apartment block in my community, the horror of two stories 
And this is, we've sort of lost, gently lost the plot. Richard, where do you suggest that millennials, Gen Y and Gen X look? I think they have to, uh, A, go to the, the lesser quality suburbs in some areas, if you can okay. put it that way. Such as what? Can you they name what the lesser quality suburbs where are, would Richard? That, where would they perhaps, be? Perhaps the you know one. that. I, I'm quite the, the ones away from, from the beachy, Auckland. leafy suburbs <laughs> yeah. that you live in. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I, I, where are the lesser quality it's, suburbs? It's a, it's Come on, tell it's, us. It's, it's what, a, what are the lesser quality suburbs? It's irrelevant to where I live. But yeah, what I'm saying is that if the council wishes to provide opportunities, then the opportunities have been provided firstly by relaxing the density provisions, so you can build many more houses within the existing suburbs than you could otherwise do so. So how do I how do I get to the city from these lesser suburbs if the public transport isn't a lot of the a lot a lot a lot of suburbs are accessible from the rail lines for example. Okay. You know, it's not an issue of quality versus lack of quality. It's a question of choice. The first house that I bought was not where I would ideally want to have lived. Yeah. But that's but that's so that's a point. You 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 can't go for your three bedroom villa in Ponsonby first off. You've got to accept the lesser is, option. And this is a line that that, that that boomers do enjoy using, isn't it? Back in my day, you've got no idea. We live this. We live that. But you did you did forgive me. Um, live in a time of full employment where people could actually just live on one. Uh, salary and you had strong unions that kept wages very high. Uh, for a lot of people, a lot of Gen Xs, a lot of, lot of millennials, a lot of Gen Y these days who also have to pay for their own education and save for KiwiSaver and are trying to compete in a property market they can't, they can't save in. <coughs> they, 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 you sort of saying, well, you can move off to some other suburbs, to the, to the, you, to the if fringes. You, if you want to make it affordable, it's yep. got to be small or it's got to be on the outskirts or a combination of both. Because Penny, otherwise it's not affordable. Right. Penny, if we look at the awful crap developments around Auckland and the way developers uh, get to run roughshod over historic buildings, you get the perception that anyone can build anything they like in Auckland. So if those interests can get away with bulldozing Auckland, why can't the council force the gentrified suburbs to give up some of their privilege? <coughs> So you make an interesting point and there's a lot made of the, the shoddy buildings and people are kind of frightened into believing that this is what's going to be built in the future. The reality is we're grappling with a whole bunch of different planning tools at the moment. The new unitary plan is, is proposed and you know Richard's had a good hand in this is saying that if you do look at greater density in some areas we have a whole swag of urban design outcomes that we expect, mm -hmm. the like of which have not been seen. Auckland City Council's plan does not make a good fist of the kind of controls that we require. So it's, it's that trade-off. Yep, if you're going to do things in a more dense fashion, you've got to do them well, and we've got the levers to pull now to say that that's what we expect. And again, that's being left out of the debate. The bottom line is, in places like Glendowie that we're hearing a lot from, mm -hmm. and Blockhouse Bay, at the moment, in, with the current zonings that they've got, they can go up to three stories if they dig down a bit. So very little has changed and will change in Glendowie and Blockhouse Bay. We need to have a look at you know what they what they're able to do now. The critical thing that can change is they can't do some of the tacky infill that people hate. If you build, you design it well. Bottom line. Well unfortunately, just taking up the last point, yep. you can actually do tacky infill. Because the design controls only kick in at three or more units. Mm -hmm. The trouble with infill is you're adding one or two units, not three. So yeah. you can do it at the so, moment, so, Richard. Yeah, correct. But there is no design control on, on those infills. And insofar as the apartments, the rules allow a big blocky building That's because right. that is the definition of an apartment. Yep. Yep. Design controls can tinker around the edges, but you will not alter the fact that it's a big rectangular building. No, I don't know. Hang on. We, we, we hear this a lot and we see the alarmist pictures that appear. Let's be really clear. If you're building a building of substance, you are required to go through the urban design panel and urban design guidelines. There are also setbacks and in all these areas you have to still have a great big slug of open space and garden. I've gone through some of these areas. You've got big blocky buildings that one person lives in with very little garden. I think we're going to do a better job. Penny, why should those who have worked hard 
to live in a nice suburb put up with having their valuations trashed by intensification? Why, 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 why so should talk they? talk to me in Auckland, A, where have values ever gone down? <laughs> Secondly, right. the minute you get subdivision and development rights on your property, the value goes up. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, we've got people, and I met with some fantastic people in Castor Bay, and older people in <coughs> their 70s who said, we live in great big houses in Castor Bay. We want to age in place. Same doctor, same dentist, same chemist, and our kids are, are close by. Why can we not find some smaller terraced houses and small apartments to live in in this area? They don't feel that those kind of developments will trash their so, area. So, so, so you're saying boomer holidays to Bali? Uh, on the valuation of their increase in, in property value, that's still good. That's still safe. The, the boomers will still be able to It'll get a nice holiday. It'll never change. Never change. But I, can, I, can I just come in and say, we can have our cake, cake, and we can eat it here. This is not a question of all this or all that. Yep. There is nothing wrong with the idea of having three, four, five, six-story apartments yep. in the appropriate places. Right. So let's just not, in, the appropriate let's not in our backyard, the appropriate No, no it, uh, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. But where let's, are those appropriate places? Let's, let's, let's appropriate think places. about around the major commercial centres, yep. some of which are in the most highly valued areas. Okay? Yep. So we have, we have intensification relative to the scale of the centre. If you've got a large commercial centre, it can take large apartment buildings mm -hmm. around it. Yeah. Yep. If you get a smaller commercial yep. centre, you have to have lower scale buildings around it. Which is it, what okay? we've got. Then you have, mm -hmm. in the next level out, you have the three storey apartments, which yep. is a mixed housing urban zone. They would go around those other apartment buildings, so you get a gradation of density. So are you suggesting which is what we've done. that the, um, uh, the, the suburbs, which are under review for intensification, all of the extra public transport that have gone into those 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 suburbs, they should just be used by the middle classes, not as an opportunity to actually intensify around those hubs. I'm still saying you're going to get a great deal of intensification yep. because if you continue what I was saying, if you take this density gradient, if I could call it, yep. from, from from big and big and high down to, down to down to smaller, you then you then get yourself down to the suburban areas which have been suburbs since the 50s and 60s, okay? They still can have unlimited density. They can still have very intensive developments, but they're of a two-story scale. So you gradate between the, the pure residential suburb areas, suburban mm. areas, which are one and two story, but quite intensive, yep. to your more intensive, to your more intensive. Well, that well, is well, an if I could just come here, the yeah. real yeah. reality yeah. is, yeah. though, that people don't want to live where Mr. Burton's describing. They actually want to live close to beaches with sea views. They want to live in the sort of suburbs which apparently, according to him, are high quality suburbs, right? And the question really is, what <coughs> is wrong with people living where they most want to live? Where the market will build houses of an appropriate quality for the people who can afford them at a density that's viable. Hmm. And, and all we ask is, hey, let, let's, let's loosen things up allow a greater variety of housing options for people. In doing so, we actually increase the supply of housing exactly. and arguably, or hopefully, make it easier for the people at the bottom. Because right now, they're the ones getting pushed out and crowded out by the lack of choice. But and it's not going to happen with 20-storey buildings along the rail line in suburbs where people don't want to live. Because who's, who's suggesting they do that? Well, the, the, your so-called gradation and this lovely thing where, you know, when it gets out to my part of the woods, it's like two stories. But when, when you're down by the railway lines along the South, uh, South, South Auckland mm. uh, line, it's all going to be 20 stories. Well, we know what that looks like. You do just have to go to Britain and to Melbourne to see what that looks like. You, it looks terrible. And none of us want that. And that's what he's suggesting. Do you oh, think? Do you I, think I, I suggest you, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Do you think that Auckland has become a gentrified city as, as a whole, that, that the poor have actually been forced out to the fringes, Māori, Pacific voices not listened to, the 206,000 people, Aucklanders who are living in overcrowded uh, homes right now, they're obviously not, they're being not, ignored. Not only that, is, are, they is, not are, are we a to, Not only are they not listened to, they're not even given a voice. Right. You know, it's all very well to wax lyrical about how people have had their zonings changed without any consultation. But what happens to the half of Auckland's own nothing? Yeah. Mm. What happens to them? Mm. 
You know, where has 2040 figured that those people in the, in, in the, in the equation? They have no voice at all because they don't own property. Right. And, and, and the problem I have is this whole system excludes mm. half the people yeah. of Auckland. 51% 51 of Auckland. 51% own right. nothing, and most of them are young, and most of them are poor. Richard, and they're totally excluded from this debate. Your action group is called Auckland 2040. With global warming set to disrupt many cities by 2040, do you at least agree that intensification, vast upgrades to public transport, and halting urban sprawl are actually necessary restraints that climate change demands upon us? Not necessarily. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't do intensification, yep. but that is by no means the only solution. There's another, there's another whole... Uh, sprawl? Uh, well, no, there's, a, there's another whole uh, thought, thought process which says, think in terms of decentralization, think in terms of, of going away from these mega sewage systems, these mega water supply systems, make it much more rural based, much, much less uh, dependent on these huge systems that cities are dependent on. Cities are very vulnerable creatures. Yeah. You know, uh, in, in, in Auckland, if there's a volcanic eruption in the oxidation ponds, we're in a serious trouble. Yeah, uh, the volcanic eruption to one side, if we just look at climate change, it's a reality for millennials, Gen Xs and Gen Ys that, forgive me, but boomers just mm. won't actually be bearing the brunt of, will they? Climate change is inevitable at this stage. The timing of it is difficult to determine. We do not know what the effects are, but certainly there's going to be issues insofar as flooding, storms. So we're, we're going, I, I, and I don't disagree with all of that. However, let's just remember that we're responsible for, as, as a, a, an elected leader of Auckland, I have to think 30 years out, and I have to think about the costs that we will impose on our ratepayers in 30 mm -hmm, years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the decisions we make are about, first of all, making the most of the infrastructure that you've all paid for now, and secondly, not saddling people with huge debt around sprawl. So I don't disagree around some of the disaggregated um, infrastructure, which is another debate for another whole day. But we need to say we're putting a great big slug of money into public transport and infrastructure. Let's make the most of it in our urban areas. Richard, I just, I just want to get this, I, I suppose I, I'm trying to, I'm asking you for a feel from these well-heeled suburbs. Are they saying to the predominantly Māori Pacific Island and renting poor of Auckland, bugger off, we're full. Is, 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 that, is that what the suburbs are saying? Look, no. we've, we're, we've got a character. What some of the councils are certain, saying. We've got a certain <laughs> aesthetic here. We don't want to ruin it. No, because if you, if you think in terms of the relaxation of density, we are proposing far more dwellings within the suburbs than they've ever had before. Okay. The problem being is if you put even high density into high value areas, you will simply get more high value dwellings. So from the point of view of people whose financial ability is not able to afford those, they are always going to be excluded. I sure as heck could not afford to buy yep. in, in Remuera or, or Parnell or Takapuna when I was in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. I just not, couldn't do it. What's the point? That's what's the point? That, yeah. I mean, the point, you know, the point say, oh, is... Young people don't have as much money as late middle-aged people and old people. Is like That's just the way of the world. I mean, exactly. Th 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 these analogies to what it was like when I was 20 and, and how uh, these apparent people, these 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds have these massive expectations. I've never met a 20 or 30-year-old oh. that believes somehow they're going to be living in a villa in Ponson <laughs> you know, when, 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 when they turn 35. You know? They, they right. don't even anticipate right. living in a villa in Ponsonby. You know? yeah. So uh, this idea that somehow the expectations of the mm. Gen X and Gen Y are somehow yeah. extreme, I think, is, is, is an overstatement. Right. I think they have very modest expectations, they absolutely and, and do. we owe it to them as baby boomers to at absolutely. least deliver on those expectations, as our parents delivered on our expectations. You know, there is a big generational mm. question here. Yeah. It's not a friction because I don't mm. think the, the the generation X, generation Y actually understand the politics is being played out here. Yeah. But it is yeah. a nasty, self-serving politics, and it's time that it was exposed, such as you're trying to do here. Well, yeah. if you want, if you want to get into affordability, yeah, yep. then don't blame either the my generation or blame the planning system. Start, start looking at things like the cost of development, the monopoly position on certain building materials that dramatically increases the prices, the development contributions that are charged by council. Start 
putting together all of the cost components that relate to the final cost of a building or a dwelling so in we're Auckland. Doing that, it's Richard. very, very expensive. We're working with the Productivity Commission, we're working with the government, we have come up with, and, and I'm sure people will be aware, of a whole lot of ways, particularly during the unitary plan, of actually cutting cost of development. We're working with producers to, to say how do we co cut the cost of materials and we're working with the government to try and get some, some support from the Productivity Commission for that. The bottom line is we can talk about all of the other issues, but if we simply cannot build the, a wider choice of houses in a variety of places that people not only want to live but have the right to live, poor people can have sea views, you know, it's a fairly outrageous idea, but they can, um, then let's actually get over this, this kind of phony war that seems to be going on. We all want the same outcome. Why on earth are we hooked up in this bizarre little place around the sco out of scope or in scope um, submissions that's going to derail the process tomorrow at council? Al Al it seems bizarre. Alan, councillors Chris Darby and Ross um, Clo are already wavering on this and could join with 11 other councillors that dump it. If Auckland 2040 win, is it a victory for the elites in Auckland or will it be a victory for Auckland? I can't see it being a, vi a victory for Auckland. I'm not certain whether you can frame it as being a, a victory for the elites. I think it's really is. Um, it's disappointing, for example, that we've got to this stage. Disappointing probably that we couldn't <coughs> have had a more uh, straightforward process. I'm not certain whether it's a victory um, for the elites, but it certainly is a victory for the status quo. Right. And, and that concerns me because, you know, mm. you just can't stay where we are. We know that. We know the huge pressures that... that that we're facing as a city. If we don't um, and, do anything. And, and, and it's a victory, we're just going to stay where we are. If, if we don't do anything, what's life going to become like for those 206,000 Aucklanders who are already living in an overcrowded uh, Well, tradition? nothing's going to change except it's going to get worse. The reality is that, it, that Auckland grew by around about 60,000 people last year. Yeah. And we built seven, eight, uh, seven or 8,000 houses. You know? yeah. We're about five or 6,000 houses short yeah. last year. You know, and, and of course, that is a real that is a real effect. That's not something that's just a statistic. Yeah. That means there's five or seven thousand households that have to find a house for someone else. Okay. And Penny's right about where that house is. It's a garage. It's 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 a it's a caravan. It's a ten square meter box in someone's backyard. You know we have to we have to we have to wrap mm. the show. But before we go, we'll do a quick final word with our panelists. Penny, what's on your mind? I had something else on my mind, but I want to say one last thing. Five years of working through this thousands and thousands of submissions and hundreds and hundreds of meetings. We can keep talking and now we need to get to the sharp end of decision making. Politicians have put it off in the past. Some of us are prepared to grasp that nettle for the good of, of Auckland and for the good of the future and I'm certainly one of them. People's hero. Richard, your final word. This, this issue we're talking about today has got nothing about merits. This is about process. Dis disenfranchising in excess of 20,000 people giving them no opportunity to have their say on a very considerable change to their streets zoning is a matter of grave concern. Council has been anti-democratic. They are not allowing anybody the say, and they tried to sneak these changes through without anybody knowing about them. Thank you, Richard. It's Alan, your final word? We refer to a democracy that only includes half the people in any, in any sort of process at all, and 20,000 are being disenfranchised from that process. I actually think that the, that, that the councillors should be brave and support what's happened. I think the moves that the, that the planning, uh, the rezonings that I've seen, it seem, seem, seem um, worthwhile and courageous, and I would encourage them to proceed with them. Uh, thank you, Alan. And to my final word tonight. Um, Auckland has been property speculated out of the reach of most Gen X's, Gen Y and Millennials. Paying for our own education, saving for our own retirement and trying to put aside enough for a deposit on homes that are forever out of reach mean Auckland's young and poor either accept becoming second class citizens in their own city or we start knocking loudly on the gentrified boomer suburbs. I don't want to commute from Hamilton, so hello St. Heliers! And if us moving in lowers the house prices in those suburbs, even better. One area we can start looking to increase housing is to take back golf courses. That we waste so much land that could be social housing for a privileged game of wealth 
is as awful as the tens of thousands of Aucklanders living in poverty. Thank you, panellists. Thank you, Farno, for watching. Streaming to you live on watiatv.com, thedailyblog.co.nz, and Face TV Sky Channel 83. We'll join you again tomorrow night, 7.01pm, for Watia for the state. Kia ora.